Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who. Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not. I couldn't figure out why, and then it hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the big Biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Arnold Leon, and hopefully you are doing well for yourself. At the time of this recording, Thanksgiving has just happened. Wherever you are, whoever you are, hopefully you are safe during a time of major, major distress going on right now. All right, then, Thanksgiving, time of giving, and usually the time for me and my family members to go and give each other gifts, but right now... Due to, you know, budget budget constraints, people losing their jobs, um, people losing income. Uh, my family lost not at 33%, but around 27 to 30% of their income because they were government jobs as we have budget cutting. So that didn't work for themselves. Um, me, I work in media. So it ain't going well for here in the L.A. County area. L.A. County, at the time of recording, is going through this second this like second re re like phase of reclosing again. Like we were closed and open and we're slowly opening and closing. Open close. What the heck is going on here? Even in Orange County, which is if you go to Orange County, like two weeks ago, you'd be like, Oh my goodness, everything is like normal here. Like you go to the malls, you can go to the retail stores, grocery stores, people are eating inside. Orange County is all fine. Uh I visit my family up in Northern California. Which is like Stockton. Uh, so at Stockton, everything is pretty much normal there. And the reason because <laughs> that weird... Because Stockton area, where I where my family lives, is like this desolated farmland. Like Stockton is one of the only places in California, one of the very few places in California that are heavily focused on agriculture. They really do. I think uh, my cousin talked about this, and there is a stat that shows it, that... That specific part of Northern California, not Berkeley, not the Silicon Valley, not San Francisco, but the specific area that is around like Sacramento, Fresno, San Jose, Stockton, around those parts is where the agriculture is incredibly strong there. And in that area, they can go like feed the entire Northern California area and majority of Western California of um, SoCal also. So for the most part, yeah, Thanksgiving has been kind of weird right now. California is in a weird state. Los Angeles County in a very, very weird state. But I will talk about the world of MMA and the world of mixed martial arts. Oh, forgot so. Not only was it Thanksgiving weekend, but also last weekend. I'm going to bring this up right now. And sadly, I have to. But there were two fights that are happening on the same night. On one hand, I can watch UFC Fight Night. That Anthony Smith, that Anthony Smith, a dude who I am. Um, Anthony Smith is one of those fighters who I just I don't enjoy watching. I really don't. We can have him against Devin Clark, or I can go and watch Roy Jones Jr. versus Mike Tyson in an exhibition fight, a very sloppy exhibition fight, but still, it's a, it's a spectacle that we're seeing these two old guys here. Snoop Dogg said it best. It looked like two, <laughs> it looked like two uncles who have no business fighting, fighting, and that's what it was. It was a very sloppy, very clunky, very riff heavy fight. So like the commentary team, especially Snoop Dogg, was riffing the heck out of this fight. All right. So Anthony Smith versus Devin Clark or Mike Tyson versus. <laughs> Roy Jones Jr., what's going to happen here? We got this beast here in Mike Tyson who hasn't fought in 15 years. And we got Roy Jones Jr., who I swear I thought retired a decade ago. I probably just fought two years ago. Insane. Absolute insanity. Two all-time greats. 
going at it at heavyweight in the year 2020 in an empty arena in the Staples Center. And the entire show itself, I'm sorry I'm going off on a tangent here, but let me give you the context of like why this UFC event pretty much wasn't all that important. It was on talk of the town. There were other combat sports events happening. And just in general, there are many things happening this past week. This past week was the NBA draft, which will go down as history as one of the most, as probably the most unique NBA draft in the history of basketball. Without a doubt. It was the most unique NBA, NBA draft ever. And there are a lot of moving pieces happening. I.e. lack of moving pieces. But there are a lot of things happening behind the scenes there. We have some prospects coming in who aren't meant to be drafted high. We got some prospects here coming with a question mark. We got some prospects going to teams that people just didn't expect. I.e. LaMelo Ball going to Charlotte. So we had the draft. We had Thanksgiving. We had Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. And in that same show, I didn't even know this fight was even happening till the day of. There was also Jake Paul versus Crypto Nate Robinson. Yes, Nate Robinson, the dunker who jumped over people in a slam dunk contest. Three-time slam dunk champion, little Crypto Nate Robinson. Fought against YouTube influencer person Jake Paul. In the co-main event, and before that, we had two other fights that honestly nobody really cared about. And in the middle of that show, there was a full-on Stoop Dog performance being performed in an arena full of nobodies. It was the most insane things I've ever seen. And so, we got the fight, we got the boxing thing going on, we got Nate Robinson going on, the NBA draft going on right now, LA County going through a re-focused re on reclosing again, again, again. We got, oh, G4, oh, G4 just got, is going through a reunion. Oh my goodness, if you ever grew up in the early 2000s, man, G4 TV, G4 was the internet before the internet really blew up, and it was like back in like 99 to 2002, it was like peak t- TV for me, I loved it. So, let's go back to the main two, UFC fight night here. So, Anthony Smith versus Devin Clark was not meant to be the original main event, so... Uh, okay, so there were two fights here that were originally ahead of the Smith Devin Clark fights. Well, let me try to pull up what were the replacements here, because when I read up the replace, when I read up that Anthony Smith was going to be the main event, I was like, "Really, dude? This is happening here? Seriously?" Uh, you see, for replacements, fight night. Because the second I heard that Anthony, yeah, so. I'm getting here. Uh, Neil Magny wants to fight against Kamta Chimaev. Michael Chandler rejects a uh, push a step up for the UFC Fight Night event. Michael Chandler just said straight up, you know what? No, I will not go and compete for the rest of the year here. I don't know. Michael Chandler is doing a really bad job right now in terms of like being in the, like, the pause of light here. Okay, so it was Curtis Blades against Derek Lewis. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh man, that was so good. Just think about that. In the same night, we had this heavyweight boxing fight between Roy Jones and Mike Tyson, one of the greatest technical boxers ever, along with one of the fucking most dangerous boxers ever. And in the same night, we were going to have two heavy-hitting dudes, Derek Lewis and Curtis Blades. Derek Lewis right now, if you've... I think Derek Lewis, especially off his last performance against Alexi Olenek, really has proven that he's like more than just a striker. And Curtis Blades is a guy who's just right there. He's right there at the cusp of finally competing for the belt at heavyweight. But sadly, Curtis Blades got murked by France and Ganu twice in an embarrassing fashion as he comes into Mortal Kombat. What the heck? Huh. So, Blades and Lewis, that fight got pulled out because Curtis Blades was, po- was tested positive. For COVID, yikes! Hopefully things went out for him. And then uh, Jonathan Pierce versus Kaikamaka that has been added into the Saturday card, but it was like really impromptu. I'm looking here right now, I'm like what? Was, and, okay, because this there was also a backup main event where it was like Anthony Smith was the backup backup main event. If you think about it, right, I'm gonna go find it. <laughs> I'm going to find out in late time. Uh, Anthony Smith says he's not done yet. Yoink, yoink. Okay. Oh, that's it. I think it was Kevin Holland. I think it was a Kevin Holland fight. 
So, oh, I was right. So, Kevin Holland, he was also meant to be in that car there. He was going to be the main event. So, okay. So, the main event was Derek Lewis against Curtis Blades. Big fight. Big, big fight. Whoever wins that fight will probably be one, maybe two fights away from getting title fight. Big. That fight got scrapped. Blades got uh, Blades got uh, got test sick for COVID, and Derek Lewis. There was there was no heavyweight who really wanted to step up against Derek Lewis. Um, makes sense. Derek Lewis is a very dangerous fighter, and then we had Kevin Holland against Jack Hermanson. Their fight was going to happen, but then their fight will be moved on to a different date. I think it's either next Saturday or next next Saturday, to which we're going to see Holland versus Hermanson. Also. Main event worthy match there. Main event. So, knowing this, when I heard the news that Blades, when I heard the, the initial news that Blades was out, that uh, Lewis ain't gonna go fight, that Holland wasn't gonna go fight, we had Anthony Smith versus Devin Clark immediately. And I'm, I remember I did a fight preview for this last week, or my idea was like, oh my gosh, Anthony Smith versus Devin Clark. Why would I want to watch this fight? Why would I watch it? Why would I want to watch it in the same card that Tyson and... Oh, man. It's so weird. It's so so weird. Okay. So, before I really get in tune... So, the rest of today's show, here, we'll be talking about UFC Fight Night and also some ongoing MMA news in the news brief here. But before I head over to the, to the short commercial break, I do want to talk quickly. Just give my quick review of the complete bonkers show that was... Um, the Tyson Ray Jones Jr. card here. So, in that card, we had Nate Robinson versus Jake Paul. To which Jake Paul immediately challenged Conor McGregor. And I can get... Conor McGregor would so accept that. He would accept it if he was offered enough money. He'd be the type of person who's like, Yeah, sure, I can go fight the celebrity. Yeah, whatever. Um... <laughs> But then it'd be so it would be like really embarrassing also because Conor McGregor fighting against Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather, those are the big fights. It makes it would make sense. Conor McGregor has a personality, and he added that he'd be open to the idea of fighting like Logan or Jake Paul in like a, some in a really bad boxing fight. I get it, but the real money, the real real money here, really isn't if he can go fight against somebody like Floyd again or Manny Pacquiao fighting against Manny Pacquiao, insanely huge. It could potentially even go on to make even more money, be more bigger than the fight against Floyd Mayweather. That's how much potential there is in the fight. I can guarantee you, he'll make a lot more money fighting against Manny or Floyd again compared to like fighting a boxing fight against Jake or Logan Paul. But whatever. So, in the Nate Robinson versus Jake Paul fight, Snoop Dogg was just ribbing on Nate Robinson, and everybody else on Twitter wasn't making fun of Nate Robinson, because the, the guy came in wearing New York Knicks colors, so first red flag there, orange and blue flag, and that this guy came in wearing New York Knicks colors, the New York Knicks are a complete joke in the sporting world, and so he came in there, he, someone on Twitter said it perfectly, he boxed like a homeless dude on cocaine. And then Snoop Dogg went up to say, this has look this Nate Robinson looks like he's trying to fight a dude in the streets. And that's the issue there. And here's an issue that a lot of people have a tendency of having. In that street fights versus real fights are two very different things. There's a reason why Kimbo Slice can go and mark people in street fights, or that one cop can go mark Kimbo Slice in a street fight, but there's no way either of those two fighters can go fight in a professional setting and mark people. It ain't happening. It is ain't. So throughout this entire fight, this super sloppy fight here, where Jake Paul is just he is mimicking what box what okay, Jake Paul he fights exactly how a lot of people would fight in the sense like they saw a lot of boxing on television, and so they believe if they try to replicate that in this real setting, it might work. Despite the fact he has no actual skill in it. So he's out there, he's doing the right moves. Like, he's bobbing, weaving, he's doing jams and stuff. Meanwhile, Nate Robinson, he's just diving in there. No fear. If you've ever played Super Smash Brothers, and you play as Luigi, you double tap forward, plus A, uh, uh, press A, and Luigi starts, like, waving his arms and, like, slapping his opponents. That pretty much 
was what Nate Robinson was doing. He was just waving his arms like he's a wacky, wavy, arm inflatable, arm inflatable two man going in there. At one point, he pretty much tripped and fell on his face in the boxing match. And then he ended up getting knocked out. Nate Robinson. What the heck, man? You're one of my all-time faves here. You get knocked out wearing New York Knicks colors. Yikes. And then we get to Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. That was a fun, fun fight. And I recommend people to watch the fights. Not really not really because it's going to be a great, awesome fight. More so in the sense that it's going to be a fight that has two huge names. And you can tell Father Time really impacted them neg- negatively. And it was a true spectacle. It was a true spectacle of fight. And I recommend everybody, anybody, if they could, try to get out of their way and see it. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Come back right after a short break here. See you soon. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. And so I just discussed Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. That fight was definitely a spectacle where it was pretty much Mike Tyson trying to replicate what he did when he was younger, trying to bull rush his opponents. But he doesn't have the power and he doesn't have the tenacity to go continue doing it at his age right now, which I think is 54 years old. 54, 55 years old. And so, which led to Roy Jones Jr. essentially poking Tyson, which leads to both of them hugging each other out or grappling with one another. In a sense, because both of them are tired. And so, Roy Jones Jr. just didn't want to deal with the onslaught of Tyson, which led to, I can't believe this. So, I was so confused whether or not that fight even had a draw. Like, had a KO victory, or you could bet on it, or if there could be draws, or if a fighter is going to be announced as a winner. Because apparently, there was an interview that went on uh, no, it's a post-press fight interview where someone asked Dana White, hey, what do you think is going to happen in the Jones-Tyson fight? And we got someone saying there was not going to be any bets. That was just going to be an exhibition. And here's the thing. It really was an exhibition. But strangely enough, though, there were betting odds. You could bet on the fight. And a lot of people bet on Tyson for some reason, knocking out Roy Jones Jr. in the first round. Insane. Even though it was an exhibition. So, of course, it was going to be a draw. Whatever, if you bet that much money, man, I don't know what's up with you, dude. I really don't. Speaking of betting here, I was really confused with the betting odds here for the main event for UFC Fight Night Smith versus Devin Clark. So, I think it was like minus 150 in favor of Anthony Smith. And that's so strange since Devin Clark is an unranked fighter in the light heavyweight division. And then we have the number 6 ranked Anthony Smith. And Anthony Smith was at one point a title contender against John Jones for the light heavyweight title. And so I was like, wow, oh my goodness, wow. People generally don't have a lot of confidence in Anthony Smith, and I agree. I myself don't have confidence. I'm not even one over all that all that much. But his victory over Devin Clark was an impressive heck yeah. So Anthony Smith was able to submit Devin Clark via a triangle choke, and I would have never guessed that, ever. Even the commentary team were joking about it. It's like, oh man, who would have ever thought Anthony Smith would attempt a submission hold? What the heck? Now, this fight coming in was expected to be like a slug out war. We got two strikers here going at it, two proper tanks. And Anthony Smith, he's finally come to the realization, and good on him for doing so, in the sense that he, just like Robbie Lawler, you're not that all good in the stand-up. <laughs> You're not as good as you think you are. You're not. Now, Anthony Smith, a warrior, 
He is one of the toughest people on earth. But it's obvious right now that Anthony Smith's strength is not good enough, i.e. his stand-up ability, is just not good enough at the highest tier and the lot heavy division. He can get away with it for being a striker in the the set the latter half of the light heavy division, but no he can get over it. He can do that in the high half in the, in the top five. I don't see him using if I saw Anthony Smith versus Glover Share against Young Blackowicz against uh Tego Santos, do you really believe Anthony Smith will be the favorite in any of those fights? Do you believe so? I don't think so here. So when I saw Smith versus Devin Clark here, I thought this was going to be a slow gap. I think it was be, this will be two guys striking it out. I absolutely wouldn't be surprised that Devin Clark would win. I absolutely wouldn't be surprised if Anthony Smith were able to slug it out and win. But I definitely was surprised of Anthony Smith going, shooting in for a takedown just like 25 seconds into the fight, getting a takedown in, and submitting Devin Clark and showing off his jiu-jitsu game here. He even attempted a twister at one point. Now, he couldn't switch it in, but the fact that he even attempted a twister in the first place showed that Anthony Smith, he is at least taking seriousness in the idea of, I think this especially after his last fights against uh, Glover Shero, where Smith was like, Smith is like known as a striker who will go all the way in, man. He's like, he's like stand-up game, exciting fighter here. He's going to tank it through. But Anthony Smith, he's coming to the realization that he isn't. In order for him to continue having a long career in the VFC. In the, and, you know, he's handling way better than Robbie Lawler is, is doing it, though. And then Anthony Smith is like, okay, there's no way I can sustain my MMA career fighting this very hectic style. This very... The style to which I'm pretty much taking and eating shots. I got to develop an all-around game here. Or I got to change something up here. I got to change something about myself here. Just think he was able to do that. He was able to turn himself from a guy who's eating shots. So he can go find a good counterpunch. To a dude who's trying to who's calculating and will find the right shot for him. Robbie Lawler though on the other hand. Yikes. Absolutely yikes. Robbie Lawler. He's fine. Taking not hard shots, but shots to the face. If it means him, like, not accumulating really serious damage. Like, the fight that made me lose all my respect for Robbie Lawler was his fight against Kobe Covington. That fight was incredibly boring. It looked like it was a sparring fight in favor of Kobe Covington. The effort and energy given by Robbie Lawler was embarrassing. And when it came to Anthony Smith and Robbie Lawler, when they main event and co-main evented <laughs> like one of the last UFC Fight Night shows, it was presented like in the commercials. It was like, look at these two warriors here, man. <laughs> like They're going to go all out there, man. Lionhearts, ruthless Robbie Lawler. Yeah. And then both of them proceeded to have a really boring fight. And someone like on Twitter said like, yeah, Really boring show, UFC Fight Night, you know, hashtag boring. And so for Anthony Smith here, fight against Devin Clark here, a really game Devin Clark, smart on Smith here for developing that all around. By the way, this is his 50th fight. This is his 50th mixed martial arts fight. Amazing for Anthony Smith there. Um, Really here, uh, I there were rumors circulating right now, or there were rumors circulating that Anthony Smith could potentially retire. And it made sense for Anthony Smith to retire, considering considering that Anthony Smith's like last three perform last four performances haven't been all that good. They just haven't there. Okay, let me look up who right now are at the top of the rankings right now for the light division for the light heavy division. Because maybe we could see him against Diago Santos. Maybe. Um, or are there any um, fighters for outside of top five? Wait, dun, dun, I'm looking through right now. Maybe there's somebody who's just in the top five. I mean, in the top ten of the division that can be used as like a tune-up fight. Something here, dun, dun, and that's not it. That's not it. Because I I don't know the rankings off the top of my head right now. All right. Okay. So this should 
not not that. <laughs> this is my regard. Dylan Dennis warns that he will shut Daniel Cormier's fat mouth over Jake Paul because Jake because Daniel Cormier said that Jake Paul would defeat Dylan Dennis. Whatever. All right then. For the most part here, I'm like Dana White in that you're not actually supposed to listen or take whatever you hear from fighters seriously anymore. You just can't. All right, so there it is. So we have uh, Glover Deshera. Okay, so we have Glover Deshera, Dominic Reyes, Diego Santos, John Blackwoods right now. So Dominic Reyes, he's going to fight against Jiro Prochaska um, in February 27th. That fight will be stellar. Stellar fight here. We have Alexander Rakish against Diego Santos. Uh, Ronaldo Jacare Souza against Kevin Holland. Wow, dang! I'm looking the I'm looking the card right now. It's full of killers. <laughs> it's full of proper killers here in this card. All actually, that's one of the cool things about John Jones not being that light heavy champion now, because for the longest time it always was John Jones and everyone else. That's how it's been for a while. But now John Jones gone. It's like Okay, we have Yon Blackwicks, and we have all these fighters here, and now you can actually be excited for all these matchups here. Like, you can be excited for Dominic Reyes against Jerry Prochaska, because if John Jones was a champion during this time, you'd be like, Dominic Reyes against Jerry Prochaska doesn't really matter, because whoever wins that fight is going to fight against John Jones and lose. Now it's Dominic Reyes versus Jerry Prochaska. Whoever wins that fight will go fight against Yon Blackwicks, and they will have a chance against Yon Blackwicks. Now that's not disrespect to Yon at all, but Yon Blackwicks is currently the guy right now in the light heavy division. And since he doesn't hold the same pedigree that John Jones has, the probability of him losing and the belt being like moved around, hot potato around, is a real possibility. Do I think it's going to happen? Do I believe John Blackwoods is going to lose his belt anytime soon? Honestly, no. It's going to be John Blackwoods against Glover Shera. That's what's coming up next. There was a rumor out there. It could be Israel the Sun versus John Blackwoods. Now that is a fight I would absolutely love to see, but I don't expect that fight happening till maybe... A year, year and a half from now. I don't see that fight happening from, uh, you know, about a year, and a, a year and a half from now. So, which means we have John Blackwicks here. He could be fighting against, he's going to be fighting against Governor Shera. We could see a rematch between Reyes and John Blackwicks. We could see Taco Santos against John. Like, there are a lot of fun matchups here. And it's really cool. But Anthony Lionheart Smith here would be the matchup that makes the most sense. And I'm seeing right now. The matchup that makes the very most sense here would have to be Alexander Rakish. No, no, no. It would be Vulcan Ozdemir against Anthony Smith. Those are two fighters who I think right now are currently in the same boat. And that you have two fighters here who at one point were pretty high in the light heavyweight rankings. And then have dropped down uh, lately. Though Vul- uh, Vulcan Ozdemir, he won his last fight against Jerry Pacho- uh, He lost... Against Jared Prochowski, but he won a fight against Alexander Rakish. So, Vulcan, Oz- uh, Vulcan Ozdemir versus Anthony Smith, stylistically wise, it could be a really fun matchup. It could be, you know, a formula for, look at these two guys going at it, man. The fight's going to end after three rounds of action, be a best split decision, or like an early round second KO. That could happen. Anthony Smith is going to be taking a lot of effort into being a grappler. And if Vulcan Ozdemir can learn himself some little bit grappling here, I'm telling you, Ozan Rivers and Anthony Smith could be a real show stealer. It can. But right now, I'm looking at it. Dominic Reyes against Jerry Prochaska coming up February 27. We have Diago Santos against Alexander Rakish coming up on March 6. And then Ronaldo Jacare Souza against Kevin Holland coming up on December 12, which is two weeks from now from this recording. And then possibly we can see Anthony Smith versus Ofok and Ostomir. So right now, yay! There is some stability in a UFC ranking. Thank flipping goodness, man. Thank goodness. Because I am so tired of champions leaving, vacating, coming back, maybe uh, retiring early. I don't get it. So, if you're not unaware of this, Khabib Nurmagomedov, he's been throwing out these weird posts. Like, like these cryptic posts. That he wants to go talk to Dana White. And there's all this speculation going on there. Like Khabib says, he doesn't. Want, he, he wants to retire. He doesn't care what the UFC offers him. And so Dana White, Dana White says he believes Khabib will come back. Khabib is saying no. Then Khabib is now going to be meeting with Dana White to talk about something here. Will it be for a fight? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. Now, what I do believe 
if you're just purely me speculating, just me speculating, it could be that could be he's coming in there. He's trying to negotiate with Dana White here. Because he'll be the one trying to negotiate. He says, like, okay, I want my top fighters, my fighters from my camp to be placed in a good position to go and appear in future UFC cards, get good pay, be on prominent cards, and if you can do that, then I will come back in X dates. That could happen. That really can. Uh, there's some member, there's some team members from Khabib's camp who are currently fighting in the UFC. One of them, sadly, he backed off. He backed off due to personal reasons here. But uh, what is one fighter who is just outside the top ten in the lightweight rankings? No, no, not the light, middleweight rankings. Yeah, there's, he's got one fighter right now just outside the top ten of the middleweight rankings here. He's got other fighters coming in. So the way I'm speaking right now, Khabib is out there to negotiate with Dana White, saying, "Hey." If you let these guys, if you let my friends over here, if you put them in a better position, I'll be open to returning. He can definitely do that. Um, I believe in Khabib's word here when he says he doesn't think he will not accept an offer from Dana White or from the UFC. But I can see him trying to offer the organization something in favor of his services. That could be a real thing right now. And also, I called it, I totally called it from... When he did his interview with the kids, where he talked about that he he liked MMA and he liked f- planting his gardens. And uh, in a recent interview, when he got to when he got to Dagestan, he was like, "Yep, I'm gonna go home, sleep, relax, and flower my garden." Yeah, so I was so on that. Yes. And so coming back after the short break here, I'll be discussing once again UFC Fight Night and going to the news brief. Coming back after the short break here. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. And so quickly go through what happened for UFC Fight Night. We had Miguel Beza against Takashi Sato. Dang, this was a um, really darn good performance here by Miguel, actually. He pretty much stopped Sato in every aspect of the fight game here. And the only problem I had with Miguel was the fact that he had a tendency of being overly aggressive in his strikes, which led to him, like, slipping and falling. Like, slipping, falling multiple times to the attempt of, like, multiple high kicks, like, hit nothing but the air. And Miguel would go for, like, spinning elbows and, like, giant haymakers. That If you were to fight somebody at the higher levels, and this was at welterweight, he, that could lead to him being put in a very bad, bad position. Although Miguel, he's undefeated right now at 10-0, and 0, there are some things Miguel has to go clear up if he wants to go and compete at the highest level at the welterweight division. And then also, we also got, wait, I'm checking here. We got Josh, uh, Josh Parisian, player Parisian, against Parker Porter. This was the definition of Rock'em Sock'em Robots. This is where he was. And you know what? Someone needs... Whenever there's a heavy bout, I get why you can... It's easy to be very, very cynical in a heavy bout. Heck, I'm super cynical whenever I see Andre Lasky. But someone has to reprimand these commentators whenever they go and they see these heavyweights 
and they immediately start making fun of them for being fat or for being out of shape or for trying anything that's not Rock'em Sock'em Robots. And this fight was a definition of Rock'em Sock'em Robots, but whenever the whenever a heavy fighter does anything that's like at all kind of technical or them trying to like block each other out or them trying to grab or do some grappling, commentary team are just riffing them. They're obliterating them on the commentary table here because before the fight even started, the camera points at Pars- uh, uh, Josh Pershon. Other camera points at Parker Porter here. And immediately, I think it was John Hannick. So, John Hannick was like, look at these two fighters here. Can can the octagon, can the octagon even hold the weight of Josh Pershon and Parker Porter here? And, and, and uh, another person commented, I think it was Dominic Cruz, like, oh man, dude, hopefully the octagon here can withstand the weight of these two giant behemoths. And I'm just like, I, I I don't I know it's a joke, but you but it's like it's so ridiculous. It's such a dumb thing to say. Like if you've got like before the pandemic even happened, even during the pandemic, actually, we have multiple people like in the double digits standing in the octagon here, and and a lot of them are, are bigger than their actual fighter than the actual fighters for the most part here. Like we'll have I don't know we can have like a middleweight there. And he's got his corner men, his corner crew there. He's got like three or four people, along with the announcer, along with Dana White, along with the interviewer person. You got like, at some point, including the cameraman, you have like 17, 23 people in the octagon at once. And nobody comments that. But, and, and look, there's like 17 people on the octagon during COVID. What the heck? But whatever. So what a, <laughs> whatever. Whatever. Commentary team doesn't make note of that. But when they see freaking Par- uh, Parjan and Parker Porter, them just standing there, and then they see the, like, the way here, 265, they're like, oh my goodness. Hopefully the octagon is reinforced because these boys are big here. They can fall right through. Just, oh man, it's frustrating. It's, I, I don't want to hear that stuff. I'm not saying fat shaming. Look, look, I don't even think they're even fat shaming in the first place, but it was like... Super uncomfortable, weird jokes to make. And I think it's very disrespectful to say those words to the fighters here. It really is. Because if they try to, like, clinch, like, the commentary team make fun of them. If they try to do, like, elbows, they make fun of them. If they try for kicks, they're made fun of. It just... Ugh, it, it happens all the time. Ugh. We also had Spike Carl against Bill Algio. These two are awesome. Proper favorites here. These are two fighters who are like, if these two, you know what sucks? It sucks that both of these fighters aren't fighting in front of a crowd because if they find a crowd, man, people will love them. People will absolutely love them. We had uh, Norma Dumont against Ashley Evan Smith. Really sad for Ashley here. She had a lot of uh, momentum carrying her away uh, last year, but then that has dipped low. Norma Dumont is five and one. And she's trying to make her way up in the women's bantamweight rankings here. It's going to take a while, though. Despite defeating a proper journeyman in Ashley Evan Smith there. Good, her, uh, good for her. We had uh, Jonathan Pierce against Kaya Kamaka. That was actually a surprisingly very exciting uh, bout there, really. And then the prelims here. Uh, we had Anderson DeSantos defeating against Martin Day. And one here that was to look out for. Rachel Osevich against Gina Mazzani. Rachel Osevich. She's 4-6 and six in her non-her UFC career. In the entirety of her mixed martial arts career, and I don't see Rachel. Listen, Rachel Osevich is like one of those fighters. I think he's kind of similar with like Paige Vanzant, in the sense of, okay, you look like a superstar, and there are people who are like, you. She does draw a crowd, but then again, it's just, uh, it, it, it's it's kind of. I don't know it, it, it's it's kind of strange. I, I it's hard for me to explain it though. That Rachel Osovich is a fighter that seems like she'd be the type of fighter that the UFC would like to promote, but she's also, but she's not good enough to get to that level. Hopefully things get better for her. Um, so Rachel Osovich, she will be out until May of next year. So for the rest of year, or for the rest of this year, man. She can relax. She can chill. And uh, this is coming in right now. This is coming straight from Rachel Ostovich here. 
uh, from RT.com here with the headline being, I am so ready for 2021. UFC babe, Rachel Ozovich, unveils racy calendar in Skippy Swimmer as she admits latest fights could be her last. So she she said uh, this on her Instagram where she's just like, posing and stuff. And she says, it's so crazy to see all um, it all brought to life. I don't know about you, but I am ready for 2021. Check it out and show your girl some love. Ostevich has completed a, has just completed a one-year ban, reduced to eight months after testing positive for banned substance um, Osterin, which was discovered in Titan Supplements. Her only complaint about returning to action was the weight cut which required it to make the limit, which she reached after settling at her fight week base and taking a range of tests, including COVID-19 checks. So... Rachel Ostevich right now, as she goes, she goes, says, my midsection is a little fluffy. Uh, the human body is so interesting. I really have to sit down and take my body to, for going through all these changes. I'm learning to not take my health for granted. I've only got one body. I'm so happy that I made positive changes to take care of me better. Ostevich seeking her first win in almost three years, to which she ended up losing. <laughs> Ironically, to like Paige Benzen also. Um, she says, I just want... Uh, yeah, so Ostevich here, she's already considering retirement right now. And, oh my god, Rachel Ostevich, by the way, has 754,000 followers on Instagram. And I can guarantee you right now, Rachel, if possible, I recommend you go have, if you don't already, have an OnlyFans account. Uh, OnlyFans accounts, uh, do Twitch streaming. Uh, find alternative means of making money because I can guarantee you, with someone who has a following of over seven hundred thousand of over seven hundred thousand followers, you can make way more money doing anything else but mixed martial arts. Follow the page Vincent Root, dude. Follow the roots where you can go make a boatload of money right now. So, you know what? I'm gonna say this right now, actually. The second Rachel Ostevich, the second she finishes up her fight contract, she's out of here. She's out of here. I'm happy that she, unlike many other fighters out there, and she's only 29 years old also. She's only 29 years old. And if she plays her cards right, she can pretty much be financially set for life. If she just plays her cards right after fulfilling her ESC contract. Or, there's a real possibility, considering that the Dana White Contender Series is doing really, really good. And Dana White is very prideful of it. We have the older fighter coming up in 2021. There's a real possibility that Rachel Ostevich can be like, hey, uh, can I just be, you know, released from my fighter contract? And I really wouldn't be surprised if the UFC brass are like, yeah, look at you, man, four and six, yeah, get out of here. And then Rachel just heads off and she continues to make a boatload of money doing other stuff. I can see that being a real possibility here. All right, and so before I get to the commercial break and onto the news brief, let me do a quick rundown of what to expect in the coming UFC events here. So coming up December 5th, starting at 7 p.m. Saturday at the UFC Apex Facility Building, we have Jack Hermason vs. Marvin Vittori coming up as the main event. They'll be competing at middleweight, at light heavyweight, light heavyweight, OSP versus Jamal Hill. Expect fireworks in that fight there. We have Montana De La Rosa against Talia Santos. Uh, Talia Santos, I expect big things from. Matan De Rosa is a proper veteran here, and I this will be a very close fight here to which anyone can win. We have uh, Roman, Dolzi, uh, Roman Dolzi against John Allen. Dolzi should win that. Uh, Nate Lundwer against Movzar Esolov. I don't know any of these fighters that much to know to make a prediction, but one is 13-0, and, and the other one's 14-3. So look at that. But I'm excited for this one. We have Gian Volante against Jake Collier being the main event at heavyweight. That will be a proper Rock'em Sock'em Robots fight. It can be. Uh, Jordan Levine against Matt Weeman. Uh, Junior Flick against Cody Durden. Ooh, Leah Tapuria against Damon Jackson. If you don't follow Leah T- Tapuria, I recommend you do. And then we have a really barn burner here. We got Luis Smoka against Jose Alberto Quinones. So, Quinonez, not really know much about but every time I see Luis Smoka, this dude lights it up. Huge, fa- huge personal favorite for mine. And then we got, oh man, this is ridiculous here. So, this is a stacked card. UFC 256, Saturday, December 12th. We have Davison Figueredo fighting as Brandon Moreno. Both of these fighters just fought two weeks ago. 
And both these fighters dominated their respective matchups. It's insane that these two are... are <laughs> oh, man. See, stuff like this is, is makes me respect these fighters a lot more. And gives me more negative bounty points on fighters like Nate and Nick Diaz and Michael Chandler. Because they're like, you know what? I got to plan out. Here's the thing. Davis and Figueredo, off him fighting twice this year. No, no. What did he start? Yo, oh, Davis and Figueredo, this will be his third fight in the past year. Yes, sir. Because he came in, gained the flight title after Henry Seguido. He vacated that. Then he won. Then, then he won the belt. They defended it, and now he's going to fight against Moreno here. So for Ricardo, man, in the span of one year, his stock has skyrocketed. Meanwhile, we got fighters like complaining, like, "Hey, man, I gotta pick and choose when is the right time to negotiate my contract so I can go and get a big money payday deal here." Like, no, Davis on Figueroa, man, he is going out there. He is putting his he's putting his gloves on. He's getting to the octagon and he's making his money. He's not buying his time trying to find the right contract. No, 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 no. He's going there, making money, making a name for himself, taking challengers, fighting three times. This year, during COVID, which will put him in the best graces for the UFC when it comes to renegotiation time. And if Davison Figueredo continues to be as dominant as he is, almost near the levels of Demetrius Johnson, which a lot of people are predicting on, I don't think it's going to happen because what Demetrius Johnson did was super special. And Davison Figueredo still has a long way to go until he replicates what Demetrius Johnson did during his time as fight champion. But guess what? Davidson Figueroa, he's putting himself in a really stellar position. Really stellar. Actually, there was a video that popped up which Dana White visited Davidson Figueroa where he, he announced that he signed uh, Figueroa's brother and he gave Figueroa $50,000 on the spots for a performance of the night bonus that he forgot to give him. So, good on you, Figueroa. Good on you. Lightweight co-main event here. Telling you right now fight of the year, this fight will be better than Gaethje Ferguson. Co-main event, Tony Ferguson versus Charles Oliveira. Wow. It's <laughs> even in their pictures, beyond, like even in their pictures, like side by side to each other, they look, like, they look like twins. We have Tony Ferguson with the black hair and Oliveira with the blonde hair here, but the shape of their head, the size of their ears, they look like twins. And even their like physicals Look incredibly similar, and they both fight this chaotic style, and they have a really unrated good jiu-jitsu game here. Fight of the Year candidate coming up at UFC 256. We have Renato Mosano against Rafael uh, Azaz. We have Kevin Holland against Ronaldo Jacare Souza. That fight will be stellar. JDS against Sergio Gaines, and Sergey Spikov against Jared Vandera. And right now there is no prelim set for that card right now, but I'll update you guys when we get around it. And so once again, you're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. And coming back after a short break here, we'll be going to the news brief. Coming back soon. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And we are back. Welcome to the news brief portion of the podcast here to which I go through a flurry of MMA news. First one is coming in from ESPN. Sort of say Leon Edwards come to Chimea fight is off after Edwards test positive for COVID-19. This is being written in by Errol Hawani. The highly anticipated Leon Edwards comes at Chimea fight isn't happening on December 19 after all. The main event fight, which is slated to be in the UFC's final one in 2020, has been cancelled after Edwards recently tested positive for COVID-19. Sources told ESPN that promotion is hoping to rebook the fight in early 2021. Sources said, but a date has yet to be finalized. Edwards' case was severe. He hasn't been able to train at all and lost 12 pounds in 4 days. 
So this is told ESPN's Brett Okamoto. He currently is in the process of recovering at home. In response to the cancellation, the UFC announced they've bumped up the Jeff Neal versus uh, Warner Boy Stephen Thompson fights, which is already set for the December 19 card. In the new main event spots, uh, Edwards, 18-3, has won his last eight bouts in a row, hasn't fought since July 19. He was scheduled to fight against Tyron Woodley in March 21 in London, but that fight got scrapped due to the whole COVID-19 pandemic. You got Kamsa Chimaev, who just knocked out Joel Machart in 17 seconds back in September. I will tell you right now, you know, Kamsa Chimaev, he's such a scary fighter. He's such a scary fight. He's a fighter who you know is top 5 quality. Like, you know, if you fight this guy, you know this is, even though he's unranked, if you fight this guy, he will murk you. That is a very, very real possibility of actually happening. And so, Leon Edwards being a t- I think, here's the I believe Leon Edwards is the, one of the only top-ranked fighters out there who is open to fighting against Kanda Chimeyev. I don't see any other type. Chimeyev is in a position right now where Charles Oliveira was, like, a couple months ago, like, even a month ago, where you've got this real threat in your division who you don't want to fight because if you beat that person, it doesn't really increase your stock. But if you fight that person, you know there's a real possibility you can go lose that fight because it's very, very tough. So Chimaya right now, the UFC is probably going to try to find some fighter who's also unranked, who is desperate for a fight, desperate for a paycheck, and will fight against comes to Chimaya and will probably lose in like under a minute. That's what I expect to happen right now. Because Ch- comes to Chimeyev, he's open to fights. He's just laying on editors right now. He's out. And obviously you're not going to play somebody, you know, who has a stat, who has the accolades of Leon Edwards. But they're going to find somebody for Chimeyev to fight. And so this is coming in. That gold medalist boxer Shields signs an MMA deal. So Olympic... Oh, oh here it is. So Olympic gold medalist boxer Clarissa Shields signs multi-year deal to fight in MMA. Shields plans to box and make PFL debut in 2021. Clarissa Shields, who signed with PFL, will make her MMA debut. Uh, Clarissa Shields, arguably the number one pound-for-pound female boxer in the world, will make her professional MMA debut in 2021. Shields, a two-division by this, being written in by Brett Okamoto from ESPN also. Shields, uh, during an interview, says that, I want to be tested, my- I want to test myself in a transition to MMA. I want to see if I can be a world champion in boxing and a world champion in MMA. That's something I want to test myself on. I'm not saying boxing is easy, but I've been to the top of the world for almost 14 years now. She goes to say, to this point, um, Shield says that she has attended a few Jesus classes and has done some work with U.S. Olympic wrestler Adeline Gray. I can say it's not as bad as I thought it would be. On the grappling aspect of a man, I thought I would absolutely hate it. I thought as soon as she grabbed my leg, I would get frustrated and I would try to bite her or something, but that hasn't happened. And so the PFL had its entire 2020 season postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but has plans to resume its 2021 season in April in Las Vegas. The promotion offers a 155-pound lightweight division for females, and is led for 2019 winner Kayla Harrison. Harrison also won Olympic gold medal in 2012 and 2016 for the U.S. in judo. She also told ESPN she and Harrison are close friends. And okay, immediately, I gotta think about this. So Kayla Harrison, there was a video out there where it was... I forgot what exact team it was, but it had... Uh, Kamar Usman, Henry Cejudo, Justin Gaethje, Khabib, and they're all talking, they're all doing interviews, and like they had this like, huge dinner thing that happened. It was very funny, because we had Henry Cejudo and Khabib talking to each other, and the fact that those two people are talking to each other is like hysterical. They have like great comedic timing with one another, but whatever. But as Kamar Usman, Henry Cejudo, and Khabib, while they're all talking about, hey, what's better, wrestling or judo? Like, you just hear this conversation talk going on. And in the background, you see Kayla Harrison. <laughs> you see Harrison, and she's in a table all by herself. She's on a table all by herself, and she's, like, yelling from, like, across the room, saying, hey, I'm better than you guys, I'm better than you guys, and Henry Cejudo and Khabib do not care. Like, it feels like there's this debate going on from Khabib and Henry Cejudo. Judo is better. No, wrestling is better. Your your gold medal doesn't really matter. Blah, blah, blah. And then you hear Kayla Harrison, all on her own, in her lonely table, trying to talk smack to these fighters here, and they just do not care. They just don't.
<laughs> and it's a uh, I, I never got it. it it was super cringy it was super cringy and I didn't get why Kayla Harrison was on her own table I didn't get it but um, continuing the interview here Shields goes and saying I was telling MMA fans I'm not just a talker I know that's what they are used to all these cloud chases out there I'm like the real deal there's room for you Anything I, anything I say, I can do. I put my best foot forward and I do it. I haven't lost a fight since I was 17 years old and I'm 25. I had 20, I had 55 wins. No, I had 77 wins as an amateur, one loss. I am 10 and 0 as a pro. First of all, 10 and 0 as a pro only? Whatever. Uh, she goes to say, I'm not coming to MMA to lose. Well, duh, who comes to MMA to lose? Unless you're like Hannah Cyphers. But the next time they see me in the cage, I'm going to have muscles coming out of my damn neck, training so hard to win. All right, then. Clarissa, muscles coming out of your neck, shields. Let's go, champ. <laughs> uh, I'm excited for it. I really am. And right now, the women's divisions right now in one championship, in one championship and UFC, and Bellator's working on this, all their women's divisions are incredibly good. I would love to see it. I would love to see her in one championship and then her competing at... Uh, I'll, I'm not really sure. Like, Demetrius Johnson and Eddie Alvarez are there, but um, I'm not sure how one championship works if you're not part of a team. Because there's like teams in one, and that, but I don't know if there's actually like any meaning to people being in teams. It's strange. And what if one like can team members fight? It's one of the aspects of one championship that I'm tr- I'm trying to understand, and hopefully I do. But it'd be total complete dream fights if we could see her compete at one. But there is the 155 pound division, and Chris Shields is a big woman. And the feather division for the UFC right now, we don't know what the status is for that division. If she were to fight in the UFC, it would have to be a bantamweight. Same thing also applies for Bellator, and I don't know if she'd be fine going for that extra 20 pound weight cut if she could go and fight at PFL at 155 so right now um I until Bellator UFC and one make more of an effort or try to go get bigger woman in a bigger woman division at 155 instead of like the one here's like the anime division I absolutely love N1 it's great I'll love to be there to be an anime division the N1 has talked about an anime division coming in in the UFC, but because of the whole COVID issue and a lot of things going on right now in the world, he put that in the back burner there. But it has been discussed for an anime division here. So, Clarissa Shields, if she is fine fighting at Bantamweight, then that would be awesome for her. It would be awesome for her in the States. So, this is coming in by MAFan.com. Charles Oliveira says, There's no way I'm not the normal contender with Tony Ferguson win. So I go and say, well, trying to scroll here. Uh, he says, it's very clear whoever wins this fight is the next top contender. Oliver said in an interview with MMA Fighting, I have to stay focused and concentrated. He was coming off 12 wins in a row, and I think he made a mistake against Ngechi, so we can't make mistakes in there. Winning this fight, I'll be the next challenger, no doubt. Seven wins in a row. At the moment, it will be eight after this, and I don't plan on leaving it in the judges' hands. It will be eight finishes in a row. There's no way I have to wait. I'm the next challenger. He goes to say, Conor McGregor retired many times. Paul Felder retired many times. They all retire and come back, Oliver said. And we're talking about Khabib, his family, his religion. The man says he's retired. Someone told me that he swore on his father's grave that he wouldn't fight anymore. If that's true, there is no way he comes back. If he comes back, he'll be going over his own word and his own father. If that's true, the guy won't come back. It's over. I'll have the perfect strategy for this fight. And I'll make it happen. He's tough and has incredible cardio. So let's go. Good jiu-jitsu. If you give him an opening, he goes there and taps you out. You have to respect that. We can't fall around because I can make a mistake also. And he submits me too. Fights are, are unpredictable. Anything can happen. But like I said, this is my moment. This is my time. I'll be 100% focused on this fight. His jiu-jitsu, his wrestling, his Muay Thai, his crazy spinning things he does out of nowhere. I'll be ready for all that. Because guess what? Charles Oliveira also does the crazy spinning things. He also has stellar Muay Thai. He also does... Cr- he is an awesome 
jiu-jitsu specialist. His grappling ability... If you watch uh, Kevin Lee versus Charles Oliveira, if you haven't yet, that fight is a masterclass in grappling from both ends, from two really stellar fighters there. And I've never seen a dude so confident in pulling out these, like, weird, cartoony hop kicks straight out of Super Mario in an actual fight, other than Charles Oliveira here. I'm telling you right now, fights of the year contender happening if it actually happens <laughs> in the news here uh, Jake Paul says he's open to fighting against Conor McGregor unless you offer Conor McGregor something more than McGregor versus Floyd or McGregor versus Manny Pacquiao I just don't see it happening uh, Daniel Cormier thinks that John Jones should fight against Curtis Blades in UFC heavyweight debut no <laughs> that is not a good matchup for John, who can John Jones fight actually at heavyweights on his debut? That could be a really good matchup. That's a Curtis Blades is very is very beatable dude for someone like like John Jones who fights John Jones style. Um, could be the best matchup for Jones in the debut. Oh, easy, awesome, Overeem. Because Overeem will be fighting against Alexander Volkov February sixth. Oh man, no, never mind. That'd be too late already. Oh man, that'd be a complete green fight. Uh, JDS. The current iteration of Junior Santos right now would be a stellar fight against John Jones. And even though JDS right now, Junior Santos, he's definitely not going to be competing for the title anytime soon. He still has that pedigree, and a lot of fighters and a lot of pro- and promoters do this. Uh, for, for, I think it was BKFC that did this. Was it BKFC? No, yeah, it was the company that or- that just hired uh, Fabrice Verdum. Like, even for Fabrizio Verdum, all right, the, the last couple of years of Verdum has not been all that well for him. But, because he has the accolade of being a former heavyweight champion, at one point was in discussion for best heavyweight of all time, defeating against Fedor Emelianenko, he can use that, promoters can use that, as your argument for why he should be in a certain position. That's what Dominic Cruz did when he fought against Henry Cejudo, where he was like, yes, I haven't done anything lately, but if you look at my pedigree... I am a pioneer at the Feather Division in Strike Force and at UFC, so I should get a title fight, even though it actually doesn't make all that much sense. So Junior DeSantos will probably be the, the matchup for John Jones, win or lose for JDS, respective of his win or loss. <laughs> Daniel Kermit believes Jake Paul beats Dylan Dennis in a boxing match. I don't know, bro. <laughs> um... I don't know what's up with Darren Cormier. He's very trolly nowadays on Twitter. Like, if you follow Darren Cormier, I feel like every two days, he goes out there and he says something, like, ridiculous, or he puts his name out there a lot, even though he's not really an active fighter now. But, like, he likes starting things for no real reason other than just, like, starting things. And Joaquin Buckley, he doubles down on calling out James Krause for UFC 257. If James Krause can make the weight, or both of them can decide on on a weight division, then that would definitely be stellar here. James Cross would, without a doubt, easily be the toughest matchup in Joaquin Buckley's career. Easily. And that right there will bring us to a close for the news brief. Once again, all I gotta say is thank you. Hope you guys had a happy Thanksgiving. Next episode, I'll be doing a special Thanksgiving special. Double special there. As I'll be looking at major UFC fights that happened in Thanksgiving weekend. So, once again, this is Arnaud DeLeon saying thank you. Thank you for listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.